Good morning, everyone. So glad to be with you all, both in person and also through our live stream on this wonderful Sunday morning that the Lord has blessed us with. This is the third Sunday in Advent. Today is the day that we get to celebrate the joy of Jesus Christ, the joy of his birth and entering into our world. And so we worship in that same spirit of joy and praise and thanksgiving this morning. Just have a few announcements that I want to share with you as we are kicking off our service of worship. A lot of uh, very special and important stuff happening in the life of our church I want to draw your attention to. Uh, The first one is, on a very practical note, I just need a couple more Advent readers. So I need uh, one more person uh, for this service, uh, the 11 o'clock next week, and also for the Christmas Eve service at 4 o'clock. And so if you're able to help out with that, please just let me know. I also want to share with you about a very special project that our missions committee is undertaking. I'm going to share with you about it. This year, there are three venues sheltering the homeless. One day program at Community Resource Center and two Code Purple overnight shelters. From now until the end of March, hundreds of meals are needed from organizations in this area. Bethel is one of many area organizations that has a history of supporting those without shelter. Our missions team will be posting a sign-up sheet on the church website the week of December the 14th, so starting tomorrow. In accordance with COVID-19 precautions, meals have to be packaged in single-serve containers. As of December 14th, there will be containers in the church kitchen for anyone who is making a meal for one of the venues. Also, look for an e-blast coming out soon with more information. The contact person is Kathy Wagner, and her email is found in your bulletin. I want to share with you some information about our prayer team and some news about our prayer shawls. And so as many of you are aware, our faithful leader for many years, Mary Grasick, has decided to step down. She has assembled a great group of knitters, and we will certainly miss her. The new co-chairs are Lynn Buckwalter and also Sandy Hudsicker. Due to the pandemic, we have not met since last March, but the willing hands have continued knitting. We have prayer shawls available and would like to get them to persons in need. And so if you know of anybody who would like a prayer shawl, please contact Lynn or Sandy Hunsicker, and their numbers are found in the bulletin. So thank you all so much, and if you know of anybody that needs a prayer shawl or could use one, please uh, contact them. Also want to share with you about a very um, important project that our women's ministry is undertaking, as their um, desire is to help women and children within our community. And they're going to be collecting new coats and gloves for women and children from December the 15th to January 1st. Tubs will be labeled and located in the back of the fellowship hall for after-worship drop-off of donations, as well as the back door of the Parsonage Meeting House. These items will be donated to the Lighthouse for Broken Wings for homeless families and others. So many thanks in advance to our church family. And if you have any questions, you can contact Amy Chasen, and her email address is found inside of the bulletin. I also want to draw your attention to an announcement from our trustees. I want to share that um, we are filling up for our Christmas Eve services. And so um, our 4 o'clock service in the fellowship hall is now reached capacity. So um, we still have space at our 7 o'clock service in the fellowship hall and also our 11 o'clock service in the sanctuary. So you want to make sure that as soon as possible you are RSVPing for our Christmas Eve services if you haven't already done so. You can contact the church office and there's also a link on our website. And please make sure each and every week um, that you RSVP for all of our in-person services. And so... Those are the announcements that I have to share with you. You can also uh, peruse the bulletin for any others. But at this time, I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Oh Lord God, we thank you for the joy and the blessing it is to gather. Whether we gather right here in this sanctuary or in our homes, God, your presence and Holy Spirit are with us. And so, oh Lord, fill us Fill us to overflowing. God, let us feel your presence with us. Let us feel the joy and the love that you share with us. And so, Lord, may we worship you this morning with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. May we worship you, O God, with every fiber 
of our being. And so, O Lord, enter us, fill us, use us to shine your light and to share your love with others. And it's in Christ Jesus' name that we all pray. Amen. So now I'd like to invite uh, Lou and Ellie Cologne to light our Advent candle, the candle of joy. Good morning. I'm reading from Isaiah chapter 35, verse 10. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return. And shall return and come to Zion with seeing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. We light this candle as our symbol of Christ our joy. May the joyful promise of your presence, O God, make us rejoice in our hope of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. If you're able, would you please stand? And join me in the call to worship. Let's read responsively. Be patient, wait, and watch, for the Lord is drawing near to us. We have gathered here this day to hear the good news and to gather strength for the times to come. Be at peace with one another. Let love and wisdom prevail. Open your hearts and souls to God's healing word. Lord, touch our hearts. Teach us to patiently listen to your words of love and joy. Amen. Opening hymn is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, found on page 7 in your bulletin.
please remain standing and join with me in the opening prayer followed by the Lord's Prayer. O oh God, you know the deserts and the parched places in our lives. We seek your healing power. Lead us on this Advent journey to the place of new birth and to the place of our redemption. For we ask this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. And so now, this time, we, as the family of God, go to the Lord in prayer. We lift up joys and blessings this morning. So I have some joys I want to lift up to you. The first is that Tom and Kathy Engel today celebrate 51 years of marriage. So we celebrate with them and happy anniversary to Tom and Kathy. We also have some birthdays to celebrate as well. This Bunny Palmer on December 15th celebrates her 91st birthday. So happy birthday to you. And also, our awesome music director, Joyce, has a birthday on December the 18th. I had to get you again. Happy birthday to you, Joyce. And so we also go to the Lord in prayer, lifting up those in need, who need God's healing and comfort and strength during this time. We lift up Lynn and Rob and Belzy, who are currently hospitalized. We lift up Jim Hoobin. We lift up Mary Sherber and Patty Niemcek Smith. We lift up those who are battling COVID-19. We lift up Myrna Chalice. We lift up Lorraine Layton. We lift up Vic and Marie Cologne who are battling COVID-19. We also lift up sympathies for uh, Rachel, who is the daughter-in-law of Marshall and Nikki Trigg. Her father, Bobby, passed away on December the 10th. And so let us continue to pray for all of the doctors and nurses and every medical provider on the front lines during this pandemic, that God would send an edge of, a extra hedge of protection and blessing upon them and all their families. So I invite you to bow your heads as we pray. And so, O oh Lord, we thank you for each and every gift, for each and every joy, for each and every blessing, for all the amazing things that you do for us, O oh God. In this season where so many of us are facing difficulty and challenge, trial and tribulation, God, help us to find the joy. Help us to find, O oh God, where you are at work. To see, O oh God, where you are making all things new. That you are sending your healing power. That you are sending your strength. And so, God, we lift up to you our nation and our world. And we ask, God, that you would send that extra hedge of protection around each and every doctor and nurse and medical provider and BB hospital and all the hospitals all over our country and world. We ask, O oh God, that you would be with them. God, that you would give them the endurance and strength that they need during this difficult time. We ask, God, that you continue to guide the scientists and those who are working on a vaccine, Lord, and to get that to us soon and safely. And so, O oh Lord God, in your mercy and your steadfast love, we ask that you hear our prayers. Hear our prayers for those that we love and cherish. Hear our prayers for those who are suffering, Lord, who are going through difficult times, whether uh, losing a job or facing economic hardship, Lord. 
Hear our prayers for any and all who need them. God, send your peace. Send your blessing. Pour out your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, in your mercy and steadfast love, we ask that you hear our prayers. And we pray together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so now, at this time, we remember that we are called to give of our tithes and offerings to the Lord. And I want to remind those who are worshiping with us in person that as you leave the sanctuary at the end of the service, the plates are there on the table in case you haven't already given. And I want to thank each and every person who gives through electronic means, online, and so many other ways. It's because of you that the mission and the ministries of Bethel Church continue. That we continue to reach others with the love of Christ and to help those who are in need, most especially during this season. So thank you, each and every one of you, for your generosity. Thank you for giving to the Lord. And so I invite you to please stand as you are able for our doxology. Please use these gifts that we bring to you this day for your glory and the upbuilding of your kingdom. Amen. And so now please remain standing for the reading and the hearing of the gospel. Oh, thank you. So now we prepare the way of the Lord. Let's do that. <laughs> Prepare, prepare, oh boy. 
stand for the gospel reading, which is found in the first chapter of Luke, verses 46 through 55, and it's found in the back of your bulletin. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant, Israel, in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Bob, for that gentle reminder. Choir, you're beautiful. Thank you so much. I didn't want to miss that. That was awesome. Thank you. So now at this time, ladies and gentlemen, I want you, if you will, to indulge me in an exercise. I'm not going to make you get up or run around or anything. It's not that kind of exercise. But I want you to close your eyes for a moment. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to think about a gift that brought you great joy in your life. It could be something that you received as an adult or in your childhood, but I want you to think about those feelings for a moment. How does it make you feel when you think about that gift? What kind of emotions are flooding your mind as you reflect upon this gift? Okay, you can open your eyes. Max Lucado, in our study together, because of Bethlehem, talked about a bike. His favorite gift that he remembers growing up was a red Schwinn bike complete with a banana seat and monkey handlebars. He prayed for that bike, he longed for it, and he even thought about it in his sleep. And once he got that bike for Christmas, he was absolutely elated. He remembers the joy and the bliss of riding that bike around and admiring it daily. He would almost say that he worshipped that bike. And for me, my favorite gift when I was a child, was a Nintendo Entertainment System. The year was 1989, and I was a little over six years old. I remember seeing that gift underneath the tree and feeling absolute elation, the most I had felt in my six years of existence. My dad couldn't hook it up to the TV fast enough. I remember years and years of playing Super Mario Brothers 1, 2, and 3, Duck Hunt complete with the light gun, Bump and Jump, and Excite Bike, and many, many more. I even had the power pad that you could run around on and play world-class track meet. That video game system brought me many years of joy, and I have a lot of happy memories when I think about my old NES. But you know, my love for video games never faded, and I enjoy when I have the time playing our Nintendo Switch and enjoying Mario Party and Captain Toad with our girls now. In our Bible study, others lifted up similar gifts that brought them joy. American Girl Doll a favorite dress, a trip to a Girl Scout camp, and even a first car. We remember those feelings of bliss and joy that was felt when we received those gifts. But as we know, eventually those feelings change and fade. Max, with his bike that he worshipped, 
eventually had an accident and he bent the fender and ruined the bike in such a way that he could ride it no more. Eventually, all the blowing in the world on my cartridges didn't make my NES work anymore. Old cars get traded for newer cars. The interest in dolls and dresses and other possessions begin to fade. Things change. Our sentiments change. Possessions cannot and will not fulfill us. Gifts that we enjoy and cherish one day are forgotten and put in a corner in the next. You know, there are no earthly things that will completely fulfill us. Possessions fade. Wealth can't make us happy. People in our lives will disappoint us, and we know that we ourselves don't live forever. Health isn't always guaranteed. There is no amount of food or earthly pleasure that will make us happy indefinitely. It's like pouring water into a jar with a hole in it. It'll never get filled. The only thing that will ultimately fill us is our relationship with God. It is the one thing that we can hold on to that will never, ever fade. It's the one thing that we can always hold on to whenever things are going absolutely wonderful in our lives or when things are completely miserable. It's the one thing that will give us strength when we go through this thing called life with all of its ups and its downs and its joys and sorrows. So I want to share a quote with you this morning that I think is worthy of our reflection. It's from the author and pastor Timothy Keller, and he writes this where it concerns worship, and I want to share this with you. It says, if we have made idols out of work and family, we do not want to stop loving our work and our family. Rather, we want to love Christ so much more that we are not enslaved by our attachments. Rejoicing is a way of praising God until the heart is sweetened and rested. And until it relaxes its grip on anything else it thinks that it needs. I'll read it one more time so you can reflect upon it. If we have made idols out of work and family, we do not want to stop loving our work and our family. Rather, we want to love Christ so much more that we are not enslaved by our attachments. Rejoicing is a way of praising God until the heart is sweetened and rested, until it relaxes its grip on anything that it thinks it needs. So worship is what keeps us grounded. It is our worship that reminds us of what our most important priorities are. Worship enlivens us, it rejuvenates us, and it renews us. When we come into worship, more often than not, we are empty. Empty from the trials and the tribulations of life. Emptied by the weariness of dealing with this pandemic and all the other issues that we face as a society and a world. We are emptied by the disagreements, the disillusionments, brokenness, sin, and strife of this world. So worship is here to fill us up, to give us the manna that we need for this journey that we call life. Worship fills us with the Holy Spirit, and when we worship regularly, we get to work in the Holy Spirit's overflow. With regular worship and praise given to God, it will make us better spouses and parents and grandparents and employees and better people in general. We are different When we are filled with the overflow of the Spirit, our priorities aren't out of whack. We get to keep things in proper perspective. Wealth and possessions and belongings and the pleasures of life are not a bad thing as long as they are kept in perspective. Worship keeps our priorities placed upon the most important gift of all, the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so this brings us to our scripture lesson this morning. This particular section of the Bible is called Mary's Song or the Magnificat. Magnificat is Latin for my soul magnifies the Lord, which is the first line in Mary's song. The song came about from Mary's visit with her cousin Elizabeth. As you heard last week, Elizabeth was to have a son born into the world just like Mary. Elizabeth is the mother of John the Baptist. Elizabeth's pregnancy is almost as miraculous as Mary's. Elizabeth was well advanced in years and was barren. And she would bear a son, and he would be John the Baptist. 
And we learned last week that he would usher in the presence of Christ and his ministry to the world. So I want us to back up a couple of verses from our scripture lesson this morning. I want to back up to something that Elizabeth said in this same chapter in verses 41 through 45. And this is what Elizabeth said. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believes that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And so Elizabeth knows the significance of the child that Mary is to bear. Mary is the Theotokos, the God-bearer. She would be the one to bring forth the Savior of the world, the Emmanuel, or God with us. And so the visit that they have together portends the significance of their children. John would be the one to usher in the presence of Jesus into the world. And Jesus would be the one who would be the word that came flesh to live and dwell among us. So Mary knows that Jesus' birth is nothing short of revolutionary. Mary's song expresses to all of us the significance of this birth and how it will change the world in awesome ways. This is Mary's form of worshiping the Lord. This is her song. And so if you've got it in your bulletins, we can take a look at it together. Starting in verse 46, it says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. So Mary is recognizing the significance of this gift. Mary was but a teenager, probably somewhere in the vicinity of 14 to 16 years old, but yet in her maturity and faith recognizes the great responsibility that she bears. Mary knows that because of this gift, she will be revered and respected forever. A lowly girl who came from lowly means, with no power or prestige of any kind, would be the one to bear the Messiah into the world. Mary stepped out on faith, allowed the Spirit to impregnate her, and risked losing Joseph and being ostracized by her family and society to bear the Messiah into the world. We should not overlook the significance and power of Mary's faith for bearing the Christ child. And so in the verses that come after that, in verses 50 through 53, she shares how Jesus' birth will change the world. She says, His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has sown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. And he has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. So the reign of Christ will change the world in ways that no one thought possible. He made things topsy-turvy from what we would expect in the world. The proud are scattered. The powerful are brought down from their thrones. He lifts up the lowly, fills the hungry with good things, and sends the rich away empty. What does this mean? What this means is that Christ's ministry is for us all, most especially the least of these. Christ came to help the poor and the downtrodden, to lift up those who are outcast, the pariah, the untouchable. He came to feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, to heal the sick, to bring down those who seek to kick others while they're down. He speaks truth to power and humbles the kings and Pharisees and religious leaders who think that they're better than everyone else because of their wealth and power and status and prestige. He changes the world by showing that in God's economy, we are all equal. The servant who shines the shoes of the king is just as precious in the eyes of God as the king himself. So does this mean that there's no hope for the wealthy and successful? Does this mean that God looks down upon those with wealth and power? No. What it does mean is that for those who do have wealth and power and notoriety, there's great responsibility. It is the God-given responsibility to do all that we can to lift up the downtrodden, those who are down on their luck and the lowly. 
those with wealth and power that humble themselves and take care of the least of these are viewed as precious in the eyes of God. With great power and wealth come responsibility. We're to use our success and blessings to in turn be used to bless others. If we do this, we too will be precious in the eyes of God and will be fulfilling the greatest commandment to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. In the last two verses of the Magnificat, Mary calls God's people to remember. She says in verses 54 and 55, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. You see, God keeps his promises. God has been with his people and will always be with his people. There are many ways in which we sin. There are many ways in which we fall short and have been disobedient to God. But yet we remember. We are meant to remember. Let us remember the good things that God has done for us. Let us remember the blessings that he has placed in our lives and the joy and the love that he's shared. I want to remind you of God's promise to Abram, who would later be called Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. And it says this, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You see, God promised Abraham that his people would be blessed. He would make a nation of the people of Israel, and in turn, all of us, a great nation. This will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ coming into the world. The gift of the gospel is not just for the chosen people of Israel. Christ came for the Samaritan, the centurion, the leper, the least of these, and all of us. Today, we lit the pink candle of Advent. The pink candle reminds us of joy. It reminds us of the birth of Christ coming into the world. Something that brings some of the greatest joy that we've ever experienced in our lives. There's no greater gift than this. No bike, no Nintendo entertainment system or car can ever top the gift of Jesus Christ coming into the world to save us from the power of sin. So let us give Christ the honor and the glory that he deserves. In this Advent season, let us together make sure that we have our priorities straight. Put worshiping the King first. Put your relationship with Christ first. Put being the light of the world, shining in a world filled with darkness, as your first priority in this Christmas season. I guarantee you, if you do, your life will never be the same. It will amaze you how much stronger your relationships with your family and others will be and how blessed you will be if you do. Don't attempt to satisfy yourself with the possessions and the things of the world. It will always disappoint you in time. A relationship with Jesus will never disappoint. The gift of salvation and eternal life will never fade and it never gets old. So dear church, we must share the greatest gift ever given. Share the joy of the Lord the joy of Christmas, and the joy of Jesus. Be blessed, and let us draw closer to the Lord each and every day during this season of Advent. Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord God, as we worship you this morning, as we hear your word proclaimed, God, you fill us up. You give us that holy manna. God, you pour your Holy Spirit into our lives in such profound and amazing ways. God, may we feel your presence in an awesome way. God, as we give you the honor and the glory that you so richly deserve, help us, Lord, to work in the overflow. Help us to be faithful in prayer. Help us to be faithful in studying your word and to be faithful in worshiping you. Let us work in the overflow putting our relationship with you first. And we will see our relationships with others change. We will see, oh God, the blessings that you provide. And so, oh Lord, use us, equip us, make us into the people that you called us to be. Oh Lord God, may our lives exude your joy, that others will see it and want to be a part of it as well. And so, Lord, help us to be a witness 
Help us to shine your light. Help us to share your joy with others in all that we say and all that we do. And it's in Christ Jesus' name that we all pray together. Amen. And so I now invite you to please stand if you're able for our final hymn of praise. Lift up your heads, ye mighty gates. So for those of you worshiping in person, after I pray the prayer of benediction, the ushers will dismiss you. So please wait for them to dismiss you before you leave. And also, if you would like to receive prayer, just let the ushers know, and you just remain right where you are, and I would be honored to pray with you after I greet everyone as they leave. And also, for those of you worshiping online, um, after I greet those that, um, and also provide prayer, I will log into Zoom and pray with any who would like to receive prayer in line. So let us pray. O Lord, let us go forth, being filled with your love, with your blessings, with your joy. Use the one life that you've given us, O God, to share your joy with others in all we say and all we do. Let us now go forth in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.